it's uh, Ross Jeff of Britain's Hidden History. We've got John Griffiths and Adam, who did this wonderful work <laughs> on uh, translating Roman stones, uh, coins, yeah. showing how you can trace British language all the way back. And they've thrown some doubt on how much of what we think is Latin actually is Latin. I'll do some more at some point on what Latin actually was. And I've got an a interview with Alan Wilson on that very subject. But I'll try and get that. It might even be up before this video, in which case you'll be one step ahead um, of what uh, John and Adam have seen. Uh, just give a quick summary of that. It's talking about, was this an artificial created language to allow diplomacy between different countries? But anyway, moving on from that, remember last time we were looking at Roman coins that could be read using the old British Colburn system. And uh, John Allen have done a lot more research since then. So what are we looking at today, gents? Um, we're going to look at uh, a stone that's come our way, which um, which uh, is interesting for very many reasons. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a surprise in the sense of trying to recognise um, how to read it. Okay. So um, it, it came about in, it came about uh, by talking to Monica Escobar, who, who lives uh, in the region above uh, Lake Constance there, and um, we, we've been talking about the British connection, the Welsh connection in, in the area. And she she's posted um, presentations on on the group before now on um, uh, Saint Lorig. And uh, she's posted items to do with the, the names in the region too. So there's there are interesting things like names which have uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, Welsh uh, sound. Uh, we certainly found one which was Mont Arban, which is in one of the uh, mountains. How do you spell Arban? Uh, Arban is uh, A F O N. So it's Mont oh, Arban, right? That's what I'm yeah, right. Okay. So it's literally mountain river, and there was a, a town called that in a valley uh, off a large river called something else but essentially the, the town was called uh, Mountain River oh cool yeah so w a few other things that uh, she's put my way in the sense of, of names of places and I think she's put a few things up on mine as well but one of the things she gave me was uh, a picture of uh, the sickness stone uh, in Mark and Vargas and I think the, uh, the stones in the State Museum, um, right. of Lance Museum, I think it's called in Stuttgart. So these things are there. Uh, and I thought, well, I've, I've had a look at the coins, uh, the, the Roman emperors. I've done a done a hundred between Julius Caesar and uh, Theodosius II, and they're all. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. We we'll put more of that up on the channel. It's brilliant. Yeah, so I'm hoping John will get a book together at some point. That I think would be an excellent uh, read all the way through, literally one emperor after after the next. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a great so, reference book as well. Yeah. So I'm having a break from that. Uh, I'm going to go back to it and have a look at because uh, I've gone like a spine down the, down the centre, but I'm going to go laterally across to some of uh, the emperors, especially the ones that we we have in mind, the British, and um, just to glean more information. Right. So in my holiday from the coins, this this has come up, and I thought I'd have a look at it. Um, and to see what I can make of it. Um, it's down It's down as um, dated to something like uh, 180 AD, I think. And it's, uh, there's a villa, there was a villa in the, in the area, and they found some, and the remnants of that, and in a sense, a, a grave as well. So it's, it's been, I think it was, I think it was dug and looked at in the 1860s. So they, they looked at it, they got the grave goods out, and we can show those pictures. Uh, should we mosey on yeah. to so these things turned up? Oh, brilliant. Work. No bodies, of course. No physical bones or, or body present. You say, of course. Why, 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 why do they well, I think they're all I think they tend to be cremated if it's Roman. Right, right. Uh, the first question I asked, what are any bones? Yeah, 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 where's the bodies, yeah. yeah. Any bodies to this tombstone, you know, but uh, she asked... No, I think this is one of the problems with the British as well, isn't it? They used to have um, what they call sky burials, don't they, where the birds would put yeah. them they clean can. and they burn the bones, so we're not going to find anything at all. So, there's uh, 
there's, there's the, the grave where that they found, and they've got a translation for the stone as well. Let's have a look at that. That's beautiful stuff, isn't it? Yeah. That's lovely yeah. stuff, isn't it? It's ceramic and great. Right. Um, so, what we're looking at here is, is, a, is a German translation. I can't read that very clearly, but yeah. I, I, I worked out the British underneath it, which is sickness. Oh, the German bit, the Arbeitsung. Yeah. Steht für Merito. Oh, uh, 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 RMT, Monumentum, Memoriam. I'll find it. Well, it just says the, mass, the, me the message, isn't it? I think. I, I, oh, okay. the next bit. Yeah, yeah, the next bit I haven't. Uh, underneath, I've got. Sir uh, Monica. Christmas. <laughs> Lived 40 years, uh, Procurse, your husband, uh, loved this tomb after birth, which is not quite sure about that particular part of the no. message. But we have, we have here the uh, uh, Crispinus, or the Crispini family, and we have a marriage uh, to Procurse. So these, these are uh, known names, but it's very difficult to trace, um, for example, if you put down Sigler, uh, Crispinus can't, can't locate it, and also Signa isn't a name. It's not a female name. When you when you look online or in books for that name, it doesn't exist. So that starts, uh, you know, uh, alarm bells going straight away. Well, okay, there's a problem there. Is there another way that we can look at that? So that's one of the things which gave me permission to see what I could make of it. Yes. Yes. So we had um, we had a look at we had a look around at that point to, to have a look at the Crispini family. He was a yeah heraldry here heraldry there. That, that's that's a piece of herald, heraldry that the, the family hold. So I I, I looked at that, uh, noted the the rose the five rose motif. Obviously we've got a, a lion. We've got we've got the blue and yellow gold in there. Which is interesting. Mm. So, from that, that's a strange one, isn't it? Actually, the, yeah, that's, is that's there, a, the, the, well, they're obviously some sort of lion in sort of two tone as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's that could be uh, that that could connote um, joint, joined lines, perhaps half one line, half another. But the motifs are there, and in a sense, the the the, the leaf motifs that are there are on the stone itself. So, if you look at the lettering. Um, if you go back to the stone there. Yeah. We've got the, you see the four lines there. there. There are spaces in between some of the lettering. We get this kind of leaf motif. Oh, gosh, yes, yeah, yeah. Now you see so that's like tied in oh, yes. too. That, that seems to be possibly tied in with, with one of the motifs of the family. And we do oh. see the name there, uh, Crispini. Could be, could be, yes. Yeah, so that's... That's... Um, that's telling. So obviously, I used those leaves as break marks when I took the four lines and, and divided the, the words to um, into chunks, as it were, to, to have a go at. Um, we'll go back to that. Yeah. Anyway, go back to the the family. Uh, they seem yeah. to be connected to the. Uh, let's go back to that last slide there. Yeah. Tell you so. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a Crispini. Th this seems to be the family that go through. So from from uh, early genealogy, which links it to that uh, Trojan past. Uh, it's many, many, many generations ago. But right at the top there, if you can see the top there, we've got Albert, fifth king of Albert, and he's um, he's tied in as George the first, seventy seventh great grandfather. And in that sense, oh. this this line is the spine of it is connected to George the First. In that well, sense, how are well, in that sense, they're only tied into it because of a marriage later on, but they they claim it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, it's an important line to follow because it follows through this family. So, you can follow this through and it unfolds right the way through to the Roman Empress if we go to the other pages there uh, we can climb up through 
into um, you know periods which are closer to uh, you know um, Constantine Chlorus at the bottom of the page there. And see how it gets to it. So they are they are immediately involved in proximity and closeness to the Roman emperors. So we have um, we have Domitian there. Uh, I think he's in the middle of the page. With oh yes, yes, I can see yeah, around yeah. it. Yeah, Domitian Longi. Gordian one, yeah. Gordian two. There we've got um, uh, Constantine Chlorus at the bottom of the page. And if we look at above uh, Constantine Chlorus, we've got uh, Flavius uh, Eutropius. He's married to a Crispini, so you can see how this thing is, is wound together. Next page. takes us through to um, Alexander, uh, sorry, Alexander the Great, where they come from? <laughs> Constantine the Great. Right, so we're up to a fourth century now, yeah? Yeah, um, to um, Constantius. Uh, we can see uh, Crispus as well, the son of uh, Constantine the Great, in that kind of time as well. So that's that's interesting. So, so, so where have these workings come from again? I just these just come from um, sketching the names down from a, a genealogy site. Okay, you know? okay. So, I, I, so it's not directly related to the carving yet. Um, not in in the sense of uh, three of the readings that I've got. This is the strange thing. I've not got one or two. I've got three readings, which which are which are plausible. You know, the plausible renditions for. Okay. Um, people on this line. Right, you get some background of the line, right? I can see there a lot of research yeah. going to that, yes. So C Crispus is there, he's the first person. When, when I looked at the stone, literally I looked at it blind, I just looked at it and I thought, what can I make of this, since I have permission, since there's no signal? Uh, what can I, yeah, yeah, yeah. What can I make of it without any other information? Only you can't, so just diving in, yeah. Mind yet, you know, I haven't done this uh, research. I just said, let me let me look blind and see what I found. So I found um, found Crispus first, and I found a reading for him which is plausible. And I think I uh, contacted Monica after that, and um, she was very pleased with it. But oh, yes, it's good this I, period, yeah. It's too good to be true. It's later than the dating for the uh, for the stone, which is about I think it's one one eighty. So it's it's much later for it. Um, she came up with a with a character um, who was much earlier. Um, uh, what's his name? Well, just to jump in quickly, I think the dating of these stones is pretty much a guess anyway. And, uh, and he's cl he's closer to about you know nine nine BC. So then I I looked at him and you know he is on the on the line. And again, he's the 56th great-grandfather of George III. <laughs> right, yes. And there's a little bit about him in history. Oh, yeah, yes. In the sense of, um, he was, uh, when young, he was a civil servant, and he was, uh, he worked in the Mint. He was a triumvir monetalis. And he knew, um, he knew Drusus, and he was a personal friend of Drusus. And he got involved uh, with him later in, um, his campaign in, in, in Germany. So he was actually there, I think, at the time okay. where Drusus and uh, Tiberius were cutting that passage through the Alps and making uh, the way through and, and subduing the area and making that region theirs and call, calling it Raetia. So right at the early period, this family members there. So that's interesting. It seems to be a tie which puts him in the right time and place. But again, it's very early. This is this is about um, you know this is about 15 BC, so it's a good deal earlier than the dating for the for the stone. And yet the components are there. There's a bit of a description of him which comes up later in the in the reading. Uh, somebody, somebody at the time, uh, contemporary writer, characterised him not very positively as a um, useless <laughs> defiant. <laughs> Well, 
guess he's also tied in there with Mark Anthony yeah. and all that, isn't he? It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so he's he, he was a supporter. Mm. He got into a bit of trouble, and he he also was uh, accused of being one of the lovers of, of uh, Julia the Elder. So he was he was either banished or executed. Yeah, he's one of those Tiberius, do you? Yeah, you don't cross in, do you? <laughs> no. So that that story's there, and and curiously, in considering the word hoard that we've called, we can actually we can possibly get that narrative out too, which wow. is really strange. It's really odd. So I'll, I'll go I'll go over that later. I'll go over over the three readings. So we put that one over too. Um, I said that one over to Monica, and uh, she thought, well, that's all kind of you know in that sense. Yes, you do have a sense of. Um, a reporter, a character report of a person that seems to fit, which is very unusual. So she went away and thought about that for a while, and she'd been checking up and down the, the family lines, and eventually came up with uh, the third person, which is um, Titus Flavius Claudius Sulpicianus. And his dates are good because he's born about. 137 so he's right in the he's right in the right period for for the stone and um and that was the that was the last one i did i'd already contacted you about this particular stone rocks and we were meant to talk weren't we? and then life intervened yes we had some technical issues didn't we yeah um, no adam <laughs> in the space <laughs> <laughs> and in the space that intervened, that was it. Um, uh, this character came forward, and he's on the list again. He's in this. He's in this line of um, that's to be connected to George the First. He's the thirty-eighth grandfather, and um, he's got a, a well-recorded history. And his narrative can also be found by by translating the the letters too. And for me, this is the this is the strongest um, of the uh, translations. Because yeah, commerce has got strong connections with Britain, of course, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on, the Septimus Severus as well. That's interesting as well. On the arrival of the new emperor Septimus Severus. Yeah. Because of course that ties in with uh, so-called Hadrian's Wall and uh, who Severus was and all this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um. Titus Flavius also is uh, he's thought to have been connected with a plot to murder Commodus. And one of the conversations I had with, um, with Monica was um, she felt that his sister was married to Commodus, which makes an even closer call, um, which was interesting, but I haven't, I haven't verified that. It's something that we had in conversation, but it does need checking. But he's at the right time. He's, he's, he's kind of the fingers pointed at him for being involved. I'm sure I've read about that conspiracy somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. And um, later on, he um, he married his daughter to Pertinax, who's also got a, who became emperor. And, right, okay. And there's another British connection with, with Pertinax, if I'm right. So this gets, for, this gets very close. After, after Pertinax died, there was another struggle for power, and it looked as if um, it looked as if Titus Flavius was off the purple, and he made an offer to the Praetorians, but uh, a higher offer came in from Julianus, and they took his uh, money, and he was made emperor. Um, it's a funny thing is how they appoint these emperors, isn't it? Yeah, it's funny, right? <laughs> how much money have you got? Well, it makes me think of what was happening in the 18th century when they brought in William and then they brought in the uh, Hanoverians. And yeah, yeah. Who wants it? How has someone else has got the right to choose? You know, this is the funny thing. Yeah. And how much power does the top man actually have? Mm, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, strange resonance is all the way down, isn't there? Mm, mm. I had those. He didn't survive the, the following emperor's um, uh, accession, though. Because he supported uh, the other guy, Claudius Albinus, and uh, he was taken out in case he might be in a bit of trouble. So, but he, but again, his story comes out very clearly in the trans.
translations, you know, uncannily closely. So we'll get we'll get onto those. We'll read them. Right. What have we got next? Right. First thing it did was to um, work on the Latin. Right. So you go back to the stone now. Yeah. Translation. Yeah. Stone. Okay. So essentially, there are four lines which divide the text, and obviously the, the leafing uh, gives a kind of interleaving. So that's the main interleaving, which you gave on a hard line. And where I felt there might be a, a break within that, or a sub-break, it gave a dotted line. So these, this is how I looked at it. All oh, right, okay, okay. So hard so, lines, there's a definite gap, and the dotted lines are your suggestions we got. Yeah, these things suggest, oh, oh, they seem to suggest themselves, you know, what can I do with that? So okay. From that, I, from from those possibilities, then I broke down the word hoard. I, I I found what I could. So, all of the things with um, Signa and Sick, the the C can be G. That opens up another sense. So it's very like the Welsh in that sense. You can you can use it, and that gave me other possibilities. So. Signatia and so on and so, and so forth. Uh, signatio. And it just breaks it open. You've got another possibility. If we break the signa in two, obviously we've got uh, sicker dagger. We've got sicarius. We've got murderer. We've got na, which can give us narrow or tell narrates. So you begin to get the options on possibilities, and that works all the way through. I don't want to go through every word here because I think. People online can stop the film and have a look at things and yeah, quite, quite like go over it and uh, come to some mind of it. But the first thing I did was the first one I pulled forward reading it was um, was Crispus. And what what seemed to come to mind Ascari, that's what I was thinking of when you mentioned yeah. that. Ascari, Ascari, wasn't it? Yeah. There's the daggers and uh, the Bible and stuff. Mm. Oh, sorry. So I, I found. I went through and felt for possible narrative. So it, it, it essentially is feeling your way through. So I got this narrative for Christmas, which was marking the sign of the cross. Brandish hostility, Flavius Julius, Christ the firm, Christ he speaks, family, of the people used to the sea, greatness. So that, that um, seems to fall into all sorts of associations for the idea of um, the, 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 the British line and the, the Christ line and the, uh, the relationship with the, um, the, the Trojan history too. Wow, there is a certain... Uh... Yes, yeah, so marking the sign of the cross. Well, um, Crispus, like his father, was, was taught by the lead Christian scholar of his day. The Christian movement was coming through. He may have actually come through earlier than we think. If he's uh, if he's presenting the sign of the cross and uh, and uh, properly associating with it completely, he's taking the cross with him on his journeys into into that region. Uh, and the and Christmas did go into that region. Uh, after the Alani had taken it over about um, 260, the Romans went out there to reassert their authority and it's to. Um, yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a piece about that which Monica sent to me yeah. to kind of back that up. That section there, around 260, the Alamani finally overran the entire border wall and conquered up the Germans. So they're 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 busy um, asserting their claims to the area, and uh, the Romans the Romans had to reconsolidate. Um, so this matches in a sense with that tussle for the for the for the, the for the ground. So it, it appears.
is in that the affirmation with Christ, uh, and then he speaks family of people used to perceive greatness, that could very well be likened to an association with the British, an association with, with the Christ family, and with identification with it. And if you wanted the Holy Grail, in a sense, for finding backup for the for the British claims, this stone in your dreams could possibly possibly be it. So it's um, you know it's a it's a it's a bit of a wild this one. So it's it's there. It's there as a you know as a conjectural reading. It's there as a possibility. So that. Yeah, it sounds like as much as the other one does, because there doesn't seem much to prop up the mainstream version of it, does it? Yeah, no. Because yeah. is a thrust or a drive, it says here. Just looking at some of the words as we, as we go along. Yeah, there, there are there are possibilities. There are other ways you can nuance it. Shall I read the, re the, the Welsh version now? So, of that line, there's a Welsh version too. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so we've done the Latin. Now, if we take the same material... We take the same narrative, or idea of the narrative. Uh, let's see where they can follow through in the Welsh. So uh, what we get in the Welsh is something which goes hand in glove with that. We've got, it reads, a, a lord's son, customary to square humility, a pinnacle. We ourselves to prosper. Well done. Welcome. Great company. Well done. At welcome, a bleak to range, a step of facing terrain to maintain, to make war. So as a statement, that, that, that really does feel like support for the Latin idea. And in the, in the sense of um, uh, a pinnacle or a force or a great wave of power in that sense at the time of... Uh, Constantine the Great and his son. That seems to that seems to um, follow. It seems to to be a, a happy um, uh, meeting. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, we have at the beginning. You know, uh, trust me to swear humility. We might have a reference to the uh, uh, a new. So, can, can which which dictionary did you use mostly for this? I used the the uh, sixteen eighty eight. Okay. I used the uh, the eighteen oh six and the the latest one I used was the uh, same as I've got here. Eighteen sixty one, yeah. Little red yeah. one, and then the, that's the one, yeah. The big printout ones from Guillaume. Yeah, I've got I've got a slightly earlier one than that, but um, I've got it handed off. Yes, yeah, it's the Salisbury one as well, isn't it? Fifteen eighty eight. Well, this one with Jones, the whole bunch here. Yeah. So I've got I've got three dictionaries, Ross. Well, that's the earliest one, I think, the Salisbury one, isn't it? Yeah, I've heard that one. There's not many words there, unfortunately. We just go back, supposedly, to fifty eighties, I think. Got this sort of layout. One of, one of the most it looks fabulous. One of the most important things to do with this work is to have a good range of dictionaries. I'm sure this could all of this could yes. be nuanced again. Yeah. There's yes. work to be done on on a. On ironing this out and, and finding even happier, uh, you know. Words. No, I agree. It's one of those things you kind of brought up. You just look things up in a, in a dictionary. You have to, sometimes you have to look up things in a few dictionaries, don't you? That's right. Yeah. yeah. It's not quite as simple as we're told. The same thing with the Latin. I, it's very hard to get a good Latin dictionary. I've got a couple of uh, everyday uh, Latin dictionaries, but I've got a couple of specialist ones too, which are really helpful. So I've had to go between the four Latin dictionaries. So, so how, how, how consistent are they in these Latin ones? How often do they think there's conjecture about words or different views? Or is it like, this word always means that? Is it, how, how firm is it? There's, there's, um, they, they, they tend to agree, but there's always the, the, there are other suggestions or extensions. So they tend, they tend to hold together, but there are things which aren't there and there are things which are there. So I think you're happy to have a you know as many dictionaries as you possibly can, and just look uh, look at a word. So, yeah, that's part of the issue is having in good good dictionaries and having an arrangement. And 
teasing out the uh, teasing out the possibilities. Obviously, the, the older the better. Yes, yes, I agree with that. So I've got proc here as well as um, a thrust or a drive. So that's really mm. yes, that's nice. That would yeah. look like in there, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, yeah, amazing. We've got to look at these inscriptions more, aren't we? Because they're. I, I, it's really interesting. I've, I've got to put it up. I, it's only an audio conversation because I was taking Alan his breakfast and he was still in bed. But it's very interesting his view that the Latin is a sort of uh, artificial construct. Yeah, it, 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 it really might be, in a sense, a, um, a bridge. Because the, the, the more I looked at the, the coins, the more they became British in my, in my imagination and the, the feeling. The Latin. The Latin dissolved, and they began, they began to feel flexible to the British. And I noticed when when there were when there were letter shapes which were ambiguous and could be one thing or another. Mm.